Hi, this is Amalia Eon Karras. Hey everyone, it's Satya, and you're listening to Love, Love Sex, Sex and, and the Hidden, Hidden Agenda. Agenda. Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Satya. Hello Satya, it's Amalia here. So, our last episode, we were talking about truth-telling and levels of truth and what truth means to different people and in different cultures. And at the end, we were talking about when you were living in India and you were there for a very long time and how lying is an accepted part of the culture there. And then at the end, you mentioned a relationship that you were in and how there were some, well, there was some kind of deception or lying involved in that relationship. And so I know that our listeners and um, yeah, we want to know the story. Oh, goodness. <laughs> of course, right? I had to like open my mouth. <laughs> oh, God. Let's see what I can say about it. Because, you know, I have dedicated myself to, to telling the truth more. Um, and you do have some really great stories. It's a good one. It's a good one. <laughs> so, truth be told, I had a relationship. <sighs> Uh, with a man who was married mm-hmm. and let's <clears throat> it was a big secret it had to be a secret um, obviously for obvious reasons but not you know it was a different culture and it was a different situation so just to give some background um, I had been separated from my second husband at the time <laughs> I've only been married twice but uh the guy who I've mentioned <laughs> before you know I had the you know, we were both abstaining from sex and doing a lot of meditation, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, I had at that point, six years of not um, being sexual. And Mm -hmm. um, well, I had a quick, after the five year relationship, I, um, I feel like we did talk about that relationship before on our podcast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just, uh, I don't want to talk about that one, but just sort of set it up that, you know, I had, I guess I'm trying to justify. Well, that you were basically a nun. So you were a nun. A nun. (laughs) Yeah, I had a little, I had an experience after being a nun that I was sort of surprised by. And then I decided to do a year of abstinence as a single person. Um, and Mm -hmm. not engage. And that whole year that I abstained as a single person, I was doing a daily meditation practice of clearing the anger that I had for uh, men, like towards men, Mm -hmm. and um, really addressing the deep rooted issues I had with my sexuality and how to hold my sexuality uh, as a single. So it was really easy to be a celibate in a marriage where I was having affection, right? Like I wasn't seeking anyone to um, give me any type of, of, of need. And I had an excuse with all the guys who were trying to pick up on me. I'm married. So it put me off the market. So being single and celibate was a totally different experience. And in that year um, of doing it on my own and making this vow to myself, um, I, I met this man who, um, you know, was in a, he wasn't separated from his wife, but he was in an arranged marriage and they didn't live together. And, you know, we had an extremely strong attraction for each other. And I tried to keep it in the creative pursuits and sort of business or, you know, in the, in the places that were safe to still explore the attraction without having it become a physical relationship. And, um, Mm. and he wasn't 
leaving it alone. Like, um, so for six months, he like pursued me so heavily and, and somehow convinced me that it was okay to be with a married person. And as you know, my story, I shared it in the last um, episode that, you know, honesty is so important to me, especially in relationship. Like Mm -hmm. I had been in an open marriage before, but there was so much honesty. Everybody was responsible adults and communicating. There were no lies. There were no secrets. And that was acceptable to me. So he convinced me, you know, that their culture and the situation, you know, I wasn't the first lover he had outside his marriage. So I didn't feel like Mm -hmm. I was, um, you know, breaking up a a perfect relationship or anything like that. Um, Right. I was just another one. It wasn't like I created it or anything like that. And there was so much synchronicity um, and so much magic around our connection that I could not, no matter how hard I tried, ignored it. I could not ignore it. I tried. I literally, I fought it for six months and then I, you know, I fell into it. I succumbed to it. And then I beat myself up for being in it and Mm. not being able to leave. And Mm. it was so toxic. Like it was so, so toxic. I got very sick. um, And I just like, I had this like self abuse going on where, you know, on one hand I was my spiritual um, teaching career had just started in India and I, I felt like a hypocrite in a way, you know, like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm in yeah. this um, deceit. What, what would be perceived from spiritual people is something wrong. Um, right. But in his reality, and even with his family, and even with his wife, uh, everybody knew he does this. And so I was living this like double life. And um, it was creating such an incongruency in myself. And I started going to a whole other level of, um, I don't know, I guess a level of loving myself, finding love for myself in the midst of, um, and, and questioning relationships once again, um, like does, is monogamy possible? Is, is marriage, like how to honor marriage and honor contracts and, agreements and so in his relationship I I couldn't speak he asked me very clearly not to speak to the wife um directly and so you know for me being from San Francisco and being with the relationship background I had um I would have been fine being in being someone's third person uh you know being this lover um partner of a married man if if the wife um made space for it, if she was 100 percent on board right but in their culture and the way he'd been doing it up until then um it was that denial that i spoke about you know like mm-hmm. everybody knows nobody talks about the elephant in the room and mm-hmm. if you bring it up it's like you're the person who's causing the trouble so it's better oh, well. you just don't that that's where like lying is honored in a sense, like, because it's diplomatic and uh, it's better for the health of everyone to not speak about it. Everybody gets it. It's like an unspoken truth. Hmm. Um, So it was fascinating. And I was in it for a number of years (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, until, you know, I realized that it just, wasn't how I wanted. I I couldn't justify living my life with this feeling of like not being able to honor the person I love publicly. Right. That's where it was for me. It's like, I don't want to hide my love. Like I found that I was having, like for him, it was very easy for me. It wasn't so easy because um, I had to stand on my own and people would whisper and those who knew, you know, I lost friends and I, I totally understood all the friends that I lost. I mean, I would have done the same thing just, you know, right. months before I met him. Right. Um, I hear that a lot from people. Um, you know, they find themselves in, in affairs um, and they would have never done it and they would have, you know, judged somebody who did it and, and they feel like, 
you know, yeah, I would never do something like that. And anyone who would, you know, there's something wrong with them. And then boom, something happens, a specific situation or whatnot. And there it is. And, and then, yeah, you totally understand how people can um, feel the way they do. <laughs> it's just... <sighs> it was such a big part of my healing. You know, I mentioned in the last uh, episode how my father had had an affair on my mom. And mm-hmm. I was very angry. My dad didn't, when he left my mother and they finally split up, I didn't know where my dad was for a couple of years. Like he just disappeared, basically. Um, oh, wow. Because there was so much uh, disruption in the divorce. And, um, when I did see him, like the few times I did see him, he would bring his new girlfriend, not the woman he had the affair with, but like some woman it was always with him. Like he, he, we, he'd ask me to go on a, like his company was having an event or something. And then he'd come to pick me up and she'd be in the car. And I, I made him drop her off. Like I wouldn't, I refused. I was like 16 at the time. And I'm like, are you kidding me, dad? Like I haven't seen you in a year and you come here with this strange woman and you're holding hands with her and I'm supposed to hang out with you guys. Oh, wow. And it was just so inappropriate and it caused a lot of buildup of anger towards my dad's like irresponsibility and not understanding how females think or operate or like I just felt so disrespected and I felt like I <sighs> I lost my my father and I felt like he was having a midlife crisis you know I made tons of judgment on him I mean I still loved him but he wasn't able to give me the the attention um and the respect I needed and so I started to like hate the other woman you know I took it out right. on the woman I didn't sure. take it out on my dad and so then being in an open marriage at first and letting my husband cheat openly in front of me as long as he told me the truth and I was like somewhat involved and knew the woman like that that somehow was acceptable and then you know I just kept having weird relationship dynamics around this pain so then to finally be on the other side of it and be be the mistress Mm. um I actually think I did a very good job at it because I understand <laughs> the wife really, really, really well. Um, and I ha- and I had just left my second husband because, you know, he fell in love with someone else and he was honest about it and we spoke about it, but it still hurt. And it was still like an open wound for me. Um, but after mm-hmm. doing that year of of clearing the anger and, and sitting with it and, and abstaining. And, and then it was kind of like a cosmic joke, really, really spirit. Like the guy who's meeting me, like no one's ever met me before. Like our connection was so deep. Anyone who saw us was like, Whoa, you guys are a strong couple. Like you should Mm -hmm. be together. Even his family, like everyone I, I did eventually a few years in meet his family. And, um, you know, they knew me as his friend. I, that mm-hmm. was the outspoken acceptance. And, um, you know, they showered me with lots of love and understanding and everyone could see this connection and couldn't deny it. You know, the connection was real. Right. So, so I was in this like loop of this is so good, but it's going against my core beliefs, my core values, my ethics as a spiritual person. I feel like I'm hiding something and, you know, I had to like leave the country and, and, go away. And I had this like epiphany one day as I was dealing with the grief and the, the sort of self hatred or abuse around Mm -hmm. it. Like how pathetic, how could I do that? How come I can't control it? Like I couldn't control it. I couldn't control who I was loving at all. And, um, and why can't I just anyone? Yeah, I know. (laughs) And I was like, why can't and I just had this epiphany as I was drawing I was driving up this really windy road and it was like a a kind of transcendental experience where I saw myself as a snake because the road that I was on was was like snaking up a mountain. Oh my gosh. And I saw myself as a snake and um I became this Ouroboros where I like 
ate my tail. It, it's weird to <sighs> say, but I mean, it was like this full on waking vision, very intense experience while I'm driving. And I, once it ate the tail, um, everything like fell into place inside myself where I, I came to peace. Like I, I learned how to love the most, the thing that I hated the most. And in that moment, I had this amazing forgiveness for all the women I had hated on. And there's a Mm. long line of them because it was, I mean, even right before I met this guy, I was doing a private session with a woman who was admitting that she was in a, you know, in love with a married man and she wanted him to leave his wife or whatever. And I got super aggressive with her in the session. And I, I stopped working for six months on private sessions because of how I spoke to her. Like I had so much judgment and it was the first time I was like, Whoa, I have way too much judgment right now because of my own personal, this is, it was triggering something in me that wasn't healed. And, Mm -hmm. um, I stopped working and then I fall in love with this guy. Oh gosh. <laughs> and then I kept working. I, you know, I came back to my work, but there was part of me that was like, oh, there's something like, who am I to be, you know, doing yeah. healing work? And, you know, I went, I went through that whole loop. And this Ouroboros moment was transcendental. It was illuminating. It was the deepest level of forgiveness I had ever experienced. And I just sort of, I got to my house, which is where I was driving, and I, I kind of fell apart in this like um, grieving of. I, I could see so clearly how I had hated myself, and then I had to like eat. I had to devour the part of me that was the most ugly part, and oh, wow. and when I did that, and I saw it transmute. Like, yes, I can love even that. Because I understand, I I finally understand what all these people were were mirroring to me. Um, but until I went through it, I couldn't. I was just judging them. I was judging everyone. I'm like, look at they're lying to their spouse. They're lying to the. You know, I had so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. About the yeah. way they were leading their lives. And what is it with that anyway? Because I've noticed that the people that have the strongest reactions to things end up either doing that very thing or that very thing is an issue or has been an issue in their life, or they have some big attachment to it somewhere. You know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying. I mean, it was in that moment that I, I, it kind of hit me. Oh, no wonder. Never say never. You know, like oh really, God, I, I said I would never be with a married man. And mm-hmm. if I was, everyone would have to be OK. And mind you, I tried that. Like when I when he was pursuing me for the six months where I wouldn't let him touch me or, you know, like I was mm-hmm. doing my best to to push this whole thing aside. Um I kept saying, you know, like, let me talk. I need to meet your family. I need to meet your wife. I need to know that she's okay with this. There's no way that I'm going to enter into this. Uh, You know, I thought I had done the right thing. And I really did. I did my best to avoid it, to make sure that my, my ethics were in place. And then lo and behold, there, I, there I was. And, um, yeah, never say never. So if there's anything that I know that I have a strong, uh, judgment against, like I would never, or I would, mm-hmm. ne- I said, I would never live in India. I said, I would never, <laughs> um, yeah, I would never be with an Indian man. I was married to mm-hmm. one. I, I was in 10 years of relationship with Indian men. Um, <laughs> I said I would uh, never be with a Japanese guy, too. I did have a relationship for like a year and a half with a Japanese. Um, everything I've ever like had this song, like, no, I would never do that. I've done it. And, and now I know, like, if, if something like that is coming up, it's probably my medicine to do that. Absolutely. I'm laughing because I've done the very same thing you know? over and over again. <laughs> What's your never say never? Oh, no, no. Mm -mm. Come on. No, (laughs) no way. There's been so many. And I, I, I'm sorry. 
but I am not even going to give us one way too chicken right now. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I, I can't. Okay. Tune in another episode when Satya tells one of her, reveals. one of those things. <laughs> called Satya reveals. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay so joe's listening joe do you have a never say never moment <laughs> do i dare it's a truth or dare <laughs> yeah never say never kind of means don't say it right like i don't uh yeah i mean yeah i've got a few of those actually so. you have to go through it. anything you can share mm, not really <laughs> no no you see <laughs> No, I'm out here on a limb, guys. Well, see, there's You're like the to only me, there's, brave there's, one. <laughs> there's personal stuff, then there's private stuff, right? And there's got to be like the never the stuff the never say never moments have been the most personal and embarrassing things for me. I would right. say for me, me too. too. I just feel all naked and exposed right now, so I'm looking for someone to join the party. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh we thank oh, you. We are in support of your nakedness. Naked oh. soul. That's what yeah. one of my teachers, she has the that's her saying, naked soul. And I really love that because um I want to live with a naked soul. I don't want to have to hide yeah. some part of me that's gonna be judged. Um, mm -hmm. So there it is, guys. Judge me if you will. But I know if you have strong judgments for it, it's going to happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> it almost always is some kind of foreshadowing, I it swear. Is. It oh, is. Because it's been like that for me again and again. Yes. And I've seen it happen to other people, too. And just who, you know, who have judged harshly and then, you know, come full circle another 10 years, 15 years, whatever it takes. Yeah. Almost to the point where I'm so permissive with people's bizarre um, stories that random strangers end up telling me their deepest, darkest secret on a regular, like on a daily basis. People who have no idea who I am or what I do, they just confide in me like their deepest desires, fantasies, mm -hmm. secrets. And I'm like, hmm. What yeah, is that? and I'm like, it's because I'm living. I, I'm I've I've revealed my. They haven't heard the podcast. They don't know I'm doing this. But it's something in my field that gives them permission. So they can sense that from you. Yeah, and I agree. I I felt that from you also. That there's just this kind of acceptance of, and I've even witnessed you um, accepting other or accepting a person I don't know or in a certain situation, and I'm kind of like wow, she's so loving with this. And and I thought I was that way. I thought I was, you know, especially being, you know, um, with the background in psychology. I mean, that's your job, right? Is to, it doesn't matter what somebody's told you. And you've heard it all. I mean, I've heard it all, right? Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, you definitely have that. Mm. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. It is. And then sometimes I put up with really bad behavior that should yeah. just be knocked off. <laughs> yeah, that's when I'm, I think that's when my little feelers come out and I want to like block you from somebody or I want to be like, step away, step back. Yeah. <laughs> like telling the other person to step back. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. back to what you were. Territory. <laughs> I'm very protective of those I love. Very, very protective. I love that about you. Thank you. And I, I need it. Um, someone's getting a phone call. Oh, it's a nice sound. Uh, I think it might be time for us to wrap up. I think it is. Thanks for listening to my <laughs> feeling share. I feel like I did a soul strip tease or something. And now I'm like just standing out there naked. Like now what? <laughs> oh my gosh. You guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> you totally got it out of me. Okay. Hmm, everyone. Protect the innocent.
Yes, you just helped a lot of people. You did. You yeah, did. so I guess the, the moral of the story is if you have had an affair and you feel bad about it, um, find that compassion and love for yourself. And if you're hating on someone who has had an affair or judging them or judging me for hearing my story, um, take a moment to look in the mirror and notice, like, what is that? Yeah. And if you're in a relationship with somebody who is having an affair and you have thought maybe they are, but you don't think, but there's no real proof or nobody's really talking about it, that might be something to look at too. Because you also shed light on that just by saying that, like that kind of blew me away. And I was thinking, oh, that's just in India. You know, people have um, like these situations, you know, or because it's okay to have a mistress, la, 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 la. But man, is that Isn't happening it like a lot every here. soap opera? I think mm -hmm. most, yeah, movies, soap opera, like every, I think it's happening so much. And, you know, I'm in Mexico and these Latinos are super hot blooded and it's super common here too. It's like, it's almost mm -hmm. accepted. And I, I hear the women talk about it very differently here. So. Yeah, it would yeah. be a whole different thing. Like in the last episode, how we talked about the different ways of truth here you know, there's just as much lying, but it gets disowned. And then so mm -hmm. people go into denial, flat out denial. So there's people, you know, in marriages where, um, where, you know, their partner might be having affairs, but they're just, they've learned to either ignore or block their intuition or I'll allow something or go into denial. Now that can be very dangerous and that can be a whole other ballgame. But and yeah. I'll just say one more thing on that, because when you repress that kind of shame, it turns into cancer. Like my, my father um, had testicular cancer. Um, and mm. Yeah. And, and it, I think that a lot of people's shame transmutes to cancer or anger. Yeah. So be careful, guys. Clear. I out. actually know. Yeah. There's another person I know in that situation and it's manifested into a disease. Yeah. in the partner with the denial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So it happens. So may this aid to our collective healing in some way. Um, I don't know. Thanks for listening. <laughs> to my and listen, shadow. love, love to everyone. Love to Amelia, uh, no judgment. And love to each, each different scenario we've just pointed out at the end of this. Love to each person in that scenario. So. Yes. <clears throat> and I just want to say, because we're just dragging this one out. <laughs> um, we can't stop this episode help because I need to say that I'm not condoning affairs and it's not something that I have continued to do or or think is okay um but my understanding of relationships has changed and is constantly evolving and I think you know it's finding for me, it's finding a new level of relating and finding, you know, sitting with my own ethics and values. And that's what I'm attuning to, not societal values. So maybe that's for another episode. Mm. But I do thank you for, yeah, thank you for saying that. That was beautiful. All right. Thank you want to tell yeah, me what If you guys have an affair story and someone wants to bear their soul with me, um, please go over to our website love sex agenda and leave us a message. We would love to read it um, and answer any questions you might have, or just hear your feedback and comments and check us out on social media. Love sex agenda. Thanks for listening. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you'd like to contact us and stay in touch with us, you can find us at lovesexagenda.com. That's lovesexagenda.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram, Love Sex and the Hidden Agenda. Bargo Day.